Welcome to the Command Post Podcast, powered by First Do. I'm your host, Tom Lewis, First Do's Brand Ambassador. Thank you for joining us today as we kick off 2023 with Mr. Jeff Dill, founder and CEO of the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance. Before we start the podcast, I'd like to share a little background about Jeff. In 2010, Jeff founded the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance, FBHA. Jeff travels the United States and Canada holding workshops to educate firefighters, dispatchers, and EMS about behavioral health awareness and suicide prevention. In 2010, FBHA began tracking and validating data on all firefighter, EMS, and dispatcher suicides across the United States. In addition, FBHA offers seven workshops for first responders, counselors and chaplains, family members, and preparation for retirement. Jeff Dill holds a master's degree in counseling, is a retired captain at Palatine Rural Fire Protection District in Inverness, Illinois. He speaks internationally about his work for his brothers and sisters. The past 10 years, he has traveled over 750,000 miles. His message offers hope and inspires all to enjoy life by understanding their own behavioral health. On July 1st, 2021, Jeff was appointed the new behavioral health administrator for Las Vegas Fire and Rescue. It's my privilege to have Jeff on the podcast today. Let's get it started. Mr. Jeff Dill, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. How are you? Yeah, I'm doing well and uh, living life uh, to to its best here here in Las Vegas. (laughs) Yeah, you're you're out west here with me. Okay, very good. Very good. So I thought we're going to have a really good conversation today about a pretty important topic or topics, actually. Uh, and, And so the mission that you have at the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance. So maybe to, to kick things off, share a little bit about uh, your background and the mission purpose of FBHA. Sure. Sounds great. Uh, you know, I, I actually started in the fire service in 1990 as a volunteer firefighter in the northwest suburbs of Chicago. And I went career in 95 and it moved up pretty quickly in my career as an officer. So I was an officer 23 out of 26 years, uh, probably a battalion chief, the longest. And so, um, you know, just flying along like most of us in the fire service, we're just flying along our career. And all of a sudden in 2005, Hurricane Katrina hit. And Division One outside of Chicago sent down numerous firefighters to help out our brothers and sisters in New Orleans. And, and when he came back, they, they just showed me some horrific pictures and videos of the devastation and they were picking up bodies in the streets and the animals that just littered the landscape. And so they struggled with that and they, they wanted to get some help. And so they went to their employee assistant program counselors, good, good people, but uh, you know, this is 2005. And we, we didn't talk about behavioral health at that time. So right. uh, counselors really didn't have an understanding as to what our culture was truly all about. So uh, I decided, well, maybe I should go back and get my master's degree. And I became a licensed counselor. And actually, in 2009, I founded Counseling Services for Firefighters, where I was starting to travel to train counselors and chaplains. And, hey, you want to work with us? You need to understand us. We're, we're, we're a little different breed. And uh, not that it's wrong from my point of view. When in early 2010, I started receiving emails and phone calls from all over the world saying, do you do anything about firefighter suicides? I said, I didn't know we had a problem. Contacted the USFA, the NFPA, the NVFC, the IFF, the IFC. Uh, uh, you give me an acronym, I, I contacted them, and no one kept any data. So in mid-2010, my wife and I, Karen, we founded Firefighter Behavior Health Alliance. And we, we had uh, three goals at that time, educational workshops, a scholarship program for children of fire and EMS that took their lives, and then uh, to create an annual weekend retreat for family survivors. And uh, I, I can tell you, Tom, it has been a a ride that I I never could have imagined Uh, this journey, this path that we've been on for 13 plus years, uh, tracking and validating fire and EMS suicides to the point now we're at uh, 1,819 that I have validated. I have personally spoken to about 1,780 chief officers or family members to validate our data. The stories 
Uh, the, the things that are, are out there are just a- absolutely incredible. And it's not just suicide. It's the behavioral health component, the stress and anxiety, the depression, uh, PTSD. And uh, in, in January here or soon, um, we will be coming out with our first white paper ever on moral injury. And uh, I've been doing a lot of research, talking to a lot of major experts, uh, Dr. Shea, uh, S-H-A-Y, he has a organization, a building in Ohio to help about moral injury. I've spoken with Chaplain Mark from uh, Rush Memorial. He's a military chaplain. He runs the moral injury unit at Rush Memorial in Chicago, as well as Dr. Bruce Litz from Boston University, who created the moral injury outcome scale that we used in our survey for our white paper. Uh, and and of course we are always trying to take care of our families and so it's uh, i've traveled well over eight hundred thousand air miles over the last 10 years across the u.s and canada i've spoken at every major conference and uh, in late last year we decided to expand by creating uh, how to uh, design a behavioral health program for your organization and that's been going over really well. We've been to three or four organizations. We're currently uh, with two right now working, one in Indiana, and the other one is the Joint Air Force bases in uh, San Antonio. And so we got another one that we're just about to sign in the Northeast. So it's, it's more than just having a peer support team or CISM team and an EAP program. For us, it's 12 different points. And so we uh, come in there, we assess it, we give you some educational workshops, we help create your guidelines and policies, and it, it, uh, it keeps us uh, very busy. And then, uh, you know, just among all that, I'm currently working as a behavioral health administrator for a large city here in the West. <laughs> so our, our hands are full, but uh, we're learning and we're teaching. And uh, it's just, it's, it's been a blessing, but at times, it can be a curse because uh, it, it takes a lot from you know our, our souls here at FBHA to these tragic stories and to hear the pain and the suffering of our brothers and sisters. You, so you said eighteen hundred you tracked. Is that did I hear that number correctly? Yes, eighteen hundred and nineteen. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, we've had four reported to us in the last five days that are not in that number for twenty twenty three. So overall, we have about uh, about 12 we still have to validate, but that doesn't incorporate the 35% that we feel we miss out on. And so we also track uh, career, volunteer, military, and wildland firefighters, as well as EMS and dispatchers. So there's there's just a whole plethora of unfortunate souls that we do not know about. And, and as an organization... We know that this is a family issue first. It will always be a family issue. And so if a family doesn't want to report it, then we understand that. Fire service personnel at times get a little frustrated. They, they're they frustrated at their chief, why they don't talk about it or don't report it, a loss. And I tell them it will always be a family's decision first. If they don't want it reported, then that's the way we should abide by it. Mm-hmm. But um, like I said, we, we miss out a lot on the... Uh, the military, I speak at a lot of military installations, especially Air Force, wildland, uh, volunteer fire, and, of course, EMS. EMS for us is private ambulance service. Got so, it. so like I said, our, our hands are full. Yeah, no doubt. Very, very full. Um, well, I lost a brother to suicide, so. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. My, yeah. my deep condolences. He was a corrections officer, so. Uh, very difficult. Uh, very difficult. Not a not a not a um not in the fire service, but um still still very painful. Um, still a, a loss. Still, still, yeah, still going going through the grieving process. So we're gonna have a I think a very good conversation as we kind of go a little deeper into into what's going on in the fire service, right? Because that's who's listening to us today. Right. And so um People self-report. So those 1800s have self-reported. You say you're missing about maybe 35% of those that just don't want to report or won't report. So, yeah. And, and the process is, is that uh, off our webpage at ffbha.org is a, a confidential reporting system. 
And, and that's how originally all the reports started coming in. But because I've traveled all over and, and made so many great new friends and departments, I've spoken at so many departments, uh, I will now get text messages or phone calls. I, I've had a fire chief who called me and said, Jeff, I'm en route to a scene where one of our members took his life. What am I supposed to say to, to our people? You know, so it, it's it's still so very new. You know, we're only 13 years into this, and, and a lot of people uh, tell us that we, they felt that FBHA really created the movement in PTSD and, and suicide within the fire service. And, and, and at times, I look back, I say, well, you know, it's, it's, there's really no competition here. This is about saving our brothers and sisters. But I recall in 2010, when we started talking about it, uh, we took a hit. There was a lot of people who would send us emails saying, oh, PTSD, that's a military issue and suicides. You're making up the numbers. There's no such thing. And and, and it put doubt in, in our minds, my wife and I. Are, are we doing the right thing? And, and I get the philosophical question all the time from people saying, Jeff, if, if you didn't start really collecting the data and letting people know these numbers, would the suicide still be so high? And, uh, and a lot of people write back say, hey, Jeff, because you talked about it, there's been so many lives you saved. So it's always that that middle ground that, that I face uh, when we talk about behavioral health in, in our brothers and sisters. What, um, what, is the what are the statistics? What, what's your impressions of the kind of the state of firefighter behavioral health right now? I, I tell you, every every time I look at it, I, I kind of find something new. And, and I'm the only one who's ever seen it. Um, my wife hasn't seen the data. She's a, she's an empath, so she she can't hear anything. I just I just tell her, uh, you know, we we lost a firefighter, and, and I'll give the state and the year, and then she adds it onto the Facebook, and and that's all she wants to know because an, an empath they absorb all that pain. Where I can have empathy, and I have plenty of empathy, but I'm able to um, separate myself from sure. absorbing all that. But I, I, every time I look at that data, Tom, it just, it amazes me, you know, and, and people, they all want to talk about PTSD and it is a very real issue in our world. There's no doubt about it. You can't see and do the things that we do. But when we look at the data, unknown is number one. When I spoke to the chiefs or families, the unknown is the number one known reason. Number one known reason though, is relationship issues whether it's spousal, partners, or, or work relationships. By far, it's the number one known reason, followed by depression. And we're talking, and you know, we're, we're we're talking about number one, we're talking about number one for depression, for suicide? Suicides. Okay. That's yes. Right. Number one, the number one known reason reported to FBHA for suicides of our brothers and sisters in the fire and EMS is relationship issues. Right. Unknown is the number one. Right. And the known one is got it. Okay. Right. Right. No, right. And then number two known is depression. And number three is then post-traumatic stress followed by medical or physical issues and then addictions. And then you have legal and financial. Now, now what I talk about in our workshops and we have eight different workshops from everything from, you know, beginners to chaplains to Saving Those Who Save Others, which is our PTS and suicide to internal size up, which is a generic where we cover addictions and relationships. We have one on retirement, how to create a behavioral health program. But what we talk in these workshops is that, you know, we can't just focus on PTSD. And, and I wrote an article called PTSD, an acceptable diagnosis. It's because no matter what conference we go to or people that write articles and kudos to them for talking about it. But I don't see too many people talking about having relationship issues or financial or legal issues. And they had suicidal ideations. And until we incorporate all of these issues to really understand how they play a role in our world, in our culture, will we move forward on accepting behavioral health? Moving so so moving forward, what are the what are what are things we can start doing now? Well, 
I'm a firm believer in education. Education, I believe, is the key to everything in the world. And if departments can really start to understand and educate their their people about behavioral health, about relationships, about addictions, about suicidal ideations, about coping skills, about therapies and resources and providing those resources, that's what education is about to know what the issue is what the problem is and then how do we you know tackle that problem and so um, the difficult thing is tom is is that you look at online now or facebook or in research companies that you want to bring in there's there's just hundreds and hundreds of them nowadays and it wasn't like that in 2010 and so the options are so much greater so you also have to do a lot more research now, what separates FBHA from everyone else in the country are, are two things. One is the data collecting. And, and you see our data used everywhere. The United States Fire Administration, the NFPA, media, uh, in white papers, Ruderman, white paper. Uh, there is, our data is everywhere. Or people will use the phrase that there's been more suicides than line of duty deaths in their yeah, article. I heard that. Yeah, that all comes from FBHA. And unfortunately, they don't credit FBHA, so that gets our board a little ticked off. But the other, so it's the data that separates us from everyone else. But number two is that 90% of all our workshops come from our brothers and sisters. You know, besides the air travel of over 800,000 air miles, my wife and I in 2017, after I retired in 2015 from the fire service, we hooked up our truck and camper and we traveled across the U.S., for uh, over a year. And I, I cannot tell you the amount of people we stopped at fire stations, dispatch, EMS organizations, and then we had workshops along the way. And then we'd stop at towns in between just to drop off tip cards, just to let people know we're out here as a, as a resource. It, it was incredible. Over 40,000 miles we put on. Wow. And we learned so much from our brothers and sisters and their families. So that's what really makes FBHA different than any other organization out there. And, uh, and, and we're pretty proud of it because uh, you know, it's, it's what our people are going through. And it's not just stuff we took off the Internet. So it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And, and I, believe me, I ask myself that question all the time. You know, growing up. I didn't lose anyone in my in my family to suicide. I never lost any f friends or anything. I saw it on the job, but uh, I'm a strong, strong Christian. And uh, I think the good Lord had just, this was what he had in mind for me. And uh, it, like I said, it's a challenge, but I've met so many fabulous brothers and sisters it, 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 to fill up a lifetime. Yes. What a wonderful mission. It really, it really is a, a, a life-changing mission, not only for you, but for those that you impact. Yeah, it's, uh, and, and I have no understanding why, but uh, I just, I just do. <laughs> so, and, and we'll do it for as long as the good Lord allows me to. Well, that's good. That's good. Yeah. That's, so do you, let me ask you this, um, and again, we may it may be a slight tangent, but you know, you, you said that you're a Christian. Um, mm -hmm. How does faith come into play with 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 what you do? Not just not so much personally, but is that is that part of your mission as far as the prevention component? It it, it can be, and, and it really it depends on on the person that calls for help, because you know we'll we'll talk about the resources. And the resources that we provide are our counselors that are culturally competent, but we also provide chaplains. And, uh, you know, it's, it's important. I have just hundreds of chaplains in my contact across the United States. In fact, I just uh, referred a, a, a firefighter down in the Southeast to a chaplain that I know really well, Brett Snow. And he was, I actually started with him in my fire department before he went to Chicago and became a lieutenant, and was on the job for, for so very long. And uh, he's just, I think people have to understand that 
when we say chaplain in, in my world, it's not that they're there to change you from Catholicism to Lutheranism. It's more of that, that spiritual based on the experiences that they've had in the job. And, and that's where so many will compare. And then others just don't want any type of uh, spiritual connection. And that's why we provide all of these different types of resources. Yeah, that's excellent. So yeah, it's there if they want it. You, you can you can weave that into it because I'm I too um, believe and and it's uh, it helps guide guide me through difficult times. Uh, and so knowing that that's yeah, right. that's an element I think is reassure is reassuring. Again, just it's one part of the whole that F, F, uh, F, FBHA pr provides. Uh, absolutely. I look at resources. I have uh, dog therapy. I have horse therapy uh, people. I have inpatient, outpatients. I have chaplains, counselors. Uh, you know, it's just we, we try to help out as much as we can. Uh, we have we work with very closely with the National Volunteer Fire Council. Uh, they uh, we've been working with them closely for almost almost 10 years. And there was there was a time uh, early on in 2011, 2012, when I, I contacted many major organizations and they didn't want anything to do with uh, FBHA and our mission at that time because no one believed in it. Uh, you know, the behavioral health and suicide, but the NVFC and Heather Schaefer, uh, she had faith in us. And uh, God rest her soul, Heather unfortunately passed away a few years ago. Uh, but, uh, you know, we, we have some great, relationships. I'm one of their lead trainers. I'm on a lot of their committees because uh, of their faith in us. Uh, American Ambulance Association, they uh, have faith in us. They have their EMS people across America call us when they're looking for counselors within the United States. So uh, a few years ago, the National Volunteer Fire Council, we discussed about creating a nationwide directory of counselors and chaplains. And we have, I have now vetted well over 500, and that is on our webpage. It's on the NVFC's webpage, and it gets you used quite there. often. I was going to ask uh, you if that's a, it's, a, it's all available there on your on the, Yes, on under, the the res, under the resource tab. And uh, it's it, the issue. I, I've seen two, Tom, two major changes uh, since 2014 that have really helped out, especially the fire and DMS world, and that is uh, peer support team development as well as counselors by the thousands who are now taking training to understand our world. And those are just absolutely fantastic, positive uh, movement towards helping our brothers and sisters. Volunteer versus career. So what, what are you seeing there? Are, are you seeing any, any, um, differences where is it where is where is, the, is there a prevalence is the other causes different um just thinking about the challenges volunteers face versus the challenges that um career career firefighters face you know and you're absolutely correct uh, like i said i i've i've seen both i've worked both i, I always felt it was more challenging as a volunteer because i responded on the calls of people i knew in a lot of these small towns, uh, they're either good friends, they're family members that are on the fire department. So it uh, it can be very difficult. And as you know, that 70% of all fire in the United States are, are volunteers. So it, that sometimes is uh, often forgotten. Um, what I will tell you about our data, and I talk about it in our workshops, there's there's no discrimination. It doesn't matter if you're a career volunteer city, suburban, rural, uh, fire, EMS, dispatch, uh, ages, ranks, it just doesn't care. There's no discrimination. So every organization should be prepared with some types of, of resources. And uh, yes, out of the uh, 1,819, 1,535 are firefighters. And I would say that out of those 1,535, and just shoot off the top of my head, but I know it, it's, it's pretty darn close. Uh, about uh, a thousand of them are career and 500 are volunteers. Okay. And that's why I say I, I know we miss 
a lot of volunteer fire because there's a lot of people that don't know about us. We don't go out and advertise. If you really look, uh, we don't go out and, and promote what we do. And, and a lot of people, <laughs> uh, marketing people as well, tell us that we, we need to do that. We need to let people know what your services are and, and what you provide for people. And, and me personally, I just, I find it so hard to do. And, and you know, because we're not, we're not boasting, we're not bragging. And so we're really looking at that for 2023 to maybe change that, to let people know who we are and what we have to offer, especially the families. You know, for nine, it'll be our ninth year of our annual weekend retreat for family survivors coming up in May. And, and I hope everyone that listens to this will circle their calendar because the third week of May is our, um, it's always our annual weekend retreat. And on that Friday night, wherever we're at, we go down to the local fire department and at 2100 hours local time, they run uh, their lights for one minute to, in silence uh, to say, we remember our fallen brothers and sisters. We go live on Facebook about 8.50 and I do a little speech and then we pan the family members that are there for the retreat that are holding pictures of their loved ones and they say their name. And then we do a bagpipes of amazing grace and then the lights for one minute at nine o'clock. It is so moving, it is so incredible. I'll tell you, Tom, these are some of the bravest people I've ever met in my life because they open up their hearts to new families. And so as new families come and, and I talk to them, I just let them know if you ever want to talk because you lost a brother, a daughter, a, a son, a husband, a wife, a spouse, partner, whatever it is, we have families that will talk to you about it and share their experiences and help you with any type of coping to get you through up and down times. And uh, this year we're in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee. Mm, okay. And yes, we are, we are going to be uh, asking for businesses uh, to donate because uh, because we're such a small 501c3, it costs us about twenty to $25,000 to put that on. My wife finds a big house with like 15 to 18 bedrooms. And uh, we, we provide all dinners and all entertainment, uh, whatever we do. We also, though, we can't pay for transportation. We just don't have that kind of funding. So we are going to be asking organizations, hey, would you like to sponsor a firefighter family to attend a retreat, uh, businesses if they want to pay for a, a dinner or travel expenses so that these families don't have to incur any type of cost. And uh, so it's uh, that's what we're working on and should be uh, having out within the next few days. Yeah, keep me posted on that one. I will. I, I will. It's uh, like I said, they they are just incredible people. Well, and then the, the ceremony that you have at nine nine you said nine p.m. the local fire station. Yes, uh, in Pigeon Forge, but anyone across we have organizations across the United States and Canada who join us, and then then when they're done, they start sending. We ask that you send us films or or pictures, and to see the families. Uh, when they see the different departments from all over, from small ones up in Canada to large ones like San Diego and Seattle and Denver, it's just, it, it really touches their heart. Mm, that sounds wonderful. So I, sounds we, actually have, we actually have a brochure, and uh, when we get off uh, from the Zoom, I will send that brochure to you, okay? Thanks, Jeff. I appreciate it. That would be That would be good to have. What a wonderful experience for those people that have suffered and had, you know, well, a profound, just a profound loss. It's it's one of our uh, most endearing uh, offerings for my wife and I uh, to to get to know these hundreds of family members these past years and, and to see them talk to each other. And it was really amazing because after our first one, which was in Savannah, Georgia, many years ago, uh, I was talking with a gentleman that I've become very close with. And he, and he said, he said, I, I knew it was going to be special because the event was held in May. And he said, in December, I got a few Christmas cards from the families that uh, we had met. And it's like, wow, you know, it's just, 
And, and they said, oh, yeah, we've been talking, you know, for the last – because, you know, my wife and I, we've never lost anyone to suicide personally. Now, I've seen – like I said, I've seen it on the job, and unfortunately with FBHA, I've uh, I've experienced uh, many losses of people that I, I got to know who would call and, and help, and, uh, and yet, unfortunately, uh, they still fell prey to their – issues that they were dealing with. <clears throat> and so, you know, to, to get to know them is, is just incredible, but it's not a real personal loss like these families have lost. Right. And so I, I can't, can't compare them. <clears throat> Jeff, what's the, what's the minimum the department should be doing? What's for, for, uh, for, for firefighter behavioral health, suicide prevention? What, what, what are, what's the minimum in your, in your opinion, that um, proactive agency can or should be doing? I, I would say minimally <clears throat> that they should have a peer support or CISM team. They should be training their employee system program counselors, or they should have a list of resources in their communities of counselors and chaplains <clears throat> that they can turn their members to. <clears throat> and, and that's what's so important about the resource list that we have created with the National Volunteer Fire Council is the only thing I really found good about COVID is telehealth has really been amazing. So you can have a, a, an EMS personnel or dispatcher or firefighter in Albany, New York, talking to a, a culturally competent counselor in Buffalo, New York, with, within the comforts of their home and, and talking about the issues. And, and that's what's important. I think organizations need to understand you need to have the resources. You need to educate your members as well as your officers on what to look for, the signs and symptoms. When we first started, we had two themes, and that was be direct and challenge with compassion. We have to start understanding that when we say challenge with compassion and, and be direct, People see us better than we will ever see ourselves. I've been married, blessed to be married to my wife, Karen, for 42 years. Oh, she wow. knows my facial expressions, my tones. She knows when I've had a rough day. And she'll say, hey, what, what's going on? And I said, well, unfortunately, I had to validate three suicides today and hearing the stories. So she knows. We have to listen to our support system. And, and I added a third one. I, in fact, I named a workshop after it called Doing an Internal Size Up. Every one of us should be doing an internal side up, size up on a daily basis. And what does that mean? It means mm -hmm. that we ask ourselves two questions. Why am I acting this way? And why am I feeling this way? And the best thing, like I said, we could do is listen to others. They see us better than we will ever see ourselves. So those are just some of the minimums, have, especially the minimums. Have those resources. Train your EAP. Train your counselors. Try to develop, and, it, and you can have a countywide, a citywide, multiple jurisdiction peer support system team. Yeah. So, those are, that's the minimum. Okay, so you have that as a minimum for, for agencies. Now, how about officers and people within the department looking out for each other, what are some of the things that they need to be aware of above and beyond the, the, the fun and the shenanigans that go on, goes on in, in the firehouse um, and, you know, the post incident, you know, um, debriefs and things like that. What, what, if you're still on the job, and again, I want, I'm going to ask you something about retirees later since I'm one as well. Uh, right. But those that are still on the job from, from the firefighter, and, and I, I say officers because they're responsible for their crews for sure. But what what are some things they should be on the lookout for, right? For with their personnel that you know you can explain right now without you know and certainly training is, is is a part of it. But what's what are some of the things that they should be cognizant of that's part of that internal size up? Yeah, we uh, we hand out tip cards at our workshops and it comes in with the top five warning signs. I, I interviewed over 600 of our brothers and sisters face to face and it, it, you know, totally and all up, it came up to the top five, which is recklessness and impulsiveness. And there's no particular order. Okay. Uh, recklessness, impulsiveness, anger, um, isolation, 
loss of confidence and skills and abilities. And, and that that's a tough one. Uh, we started seeing a lot of that in the recent years when a brother or sister would say, hey, I'm going to an inpatient facility to handle my uh, anger or my depression, my addictions. And we started seeing so many of our brothers and sisters say, oh, yeah, kudos to you. You're, you're going to get help. Uh, we support you. We support you. And then when they come back, the thought is, oh, wait, you're coming back to our shift? Uh, are you going to be all right? Uh, you know, will you be able, you, you're not going to have any incident while we're on the scene and things. And it started questioning uh, the, you know, the heart of what those firefighters intent was, is that I was supposed to get help. Everyone said, great job. You went and got help. Now they're questioning whether I can do the job. And that really brought in an increase of loss of confidence and to the point now where we have started seeing our brothers and sisters take their lives because of it. And, and then the last one, of course, is sleep deprivation. You know, you start sleep, is, as you know, it's, it's an issue that we talk about all the time, and yet there hasn't been re anything really uh, being resolved outside of ther different type of therapies to help with our sleep deprivation. The schedules are, are just absolutely horrific and very difficult. So as an officer, you have to know that relationships is the number one known reason why our members are, are killing themselves. So if they're going through a divorce, or if they're going through some type of breakup or a family matter, a family's injured, a, sp a child, a, a, a spouse or partner who's lost a job, they need to start talking to their people about these issues. Hey, uh, I'm sorry that you're going through divorce. Um, you know, I'm here for you. And they have to learn how to listen. And that's key. You know, we talk about this all the time in the workshops. Learn how to listen. You know, and that's role reversal for us, Tom, because we're always going out trying to solve all the problems oh, for when sure, people right? die. Right? For and, sure. and you can't solve their problems. Even as a counselor, I can't solve their problems. I can walk the walk with them. I can make some recommendations. If you want to try this, I see how that worked. Did it work for you? It didn't. Let's try this. But as a officer or even a peer support team member, confidentiality, um, the ability to find resources and the ability to walk the walk and learn how to listen to them. That's your role. And, and it shouldn't be anything more than that. And so officers, that's what we tell them. Learn how to listen. Learn how to read your people, you know, challenge with compassion, be direct when you see that they might be struggling. Because a lot of times, and I would say more than not, we will see that they are struggling. But I can't say that every time because I'm told all the time, you know, that was the last person I thought that would kill themselves. We saw no signs or indications. And that's what makes it so difficult to try to prevent these. You know, one of the things that really bothers me is when people say, Jeff, you're the expert in this field. What can, what, what can we do or what are this? And I tell them, I am no expert. I will debate anyone that says they're an expert that they can understand these because I've been doing this a long time, Tom. I've, I've heard and seen so many things. I can't understand them. Now, I can pinpoint a few things to watch out for, to look for. But I, I just can't, you know, and the one example I give all the time, you know, a, fire, a firefighter was in an argument with his 10 year old son and his 10 year old son out of spite because children say things out of spite says, well, maybe I'll just kill myself. And the father said, no, maybe I will. And went out to the backyard and shot himself. I, I don't understand that, Tom. I, I can't. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I would debate anyone that says that they can. So a, a lot of times <laughs> I, I, I base it on what I call cognitive disconnect. And for me, cognitive disconnect is simply we base decisions on the emotions we're going through and reality goes right out the window. That's, and that's so my brother right there. That, that's, you just yeah. described what happened to my brother. And whether it's anger, jealousy, guilt, uh, pain from emotional issues, relationship issues, whatever that emotion is, they, they base it on, oh, my, my family would be better off. I, I will tell you right now, Tom, I know hundreds of our family members. In all my years, I've never heard one family member say, oh, geez, thank God that SOB is gone, man. Life's a lot better. 
I have <laughs> never heard that yet. But that belief, that cognitive disconnect at that moment, that re that reality goes right out the window. And so if we can train and educate our people to do that internal size up on a daily basis, why am I acting this way? Why am I feeling this way before it gets to that cognitive disconnect? I believe will make a big difference. What are those five things again? Go over those five things that you had mentioned that's sure. on the card. Re recklessness and impulsiveness. Okay. Number two is anger. Number three is isolation. We do a great job of isolating. I'm also a firm believer the fire service in particular is doing a great job of promoting isolation by having individual bunk rooms. Oh. Right? Let's, let's, it gives, let's we'll come back to that. Go finish the five, but I want to go right. back to that. Okay. Loss of confidence and skills and abilities, and then sleep deprivation. Sleep deprivation. Okay. So we've got those five to be, be aware of and look out for. So... I mean, there's many more, but those were the top five. Those, yeah, those top top five. And again, we can chunk things. Span of control, right? Chunk right. things, in one, you know, three to seven. Right. That's a nice. That's a nice number five to be able to look, look out for those those top five. Um, I hope people took that to heart. Those those five. Um, what um, I want to go back real quick since you mentioned it. Single bunk rooms versus. Community bunk rooms. I I grew up in the community bunk room environment and have ridiculously fun, wonderful memories. Um, and now everything is separate bunk rooms. So I don't think we're going to change that because it sounds like um, prevention of infectious disease and sleep and all of that trump the so other social components. But what's your take on that? Well, and, and believe me, I talk about this in all my workshops, uh, that I'm a firm believer the fire service is promoting isolation. And I experienced it because like you, uh, when I first started my career, we had a big room, officers and uh, male, females slept together in them. And, it, and I came home one morning and I had a big black eye and my wife said, oh my God, did you get hurt on a call? I said, no, it was a toilet tissue war. And I got nailed right in the eye with a roll of toilet tissue. It was the camaraderie we had. Right. At four o'clock, we all went to the kitchen. We we talked, and the chef made dinner. And then we uh, ate, did dishes, and then we played, you know, board games or talked till midnight. Well, once we got our new station that had individual rooms and things, what happened at four o'clock? Phew! Yeah, everyone went into their individual room. I saw too the bail. Right, and and I went through that when, unfortunately, at twenty two months old, my granddaughter lost her right eye to cancer, retinoblastoma. Oh. And, and I struggled with it. And I was fortunate as a battalion chief. I had my own office. It was in the front of the station. And so I would just say, hey, I got a lot of work to do. And, and it became so easy. And so, yes, we're, we're, we're probably never going to go back. But it's something that we have to watch out for, that isolation. Right. Any tips on countering that? I mean, I think, you know, movie night on, you know, the last fifth of the tour or something to get people... Well, it, it is important because, and I saw it, and I'm sure everyone else has seen it. Uh, you know, after dinner, I'd walk into the day room, and, and there are two of my firefighters on their phone, phones playing games against each other. So we, we lost the social skills. And I think we're losing that in society as well. And so we really need to try to have officers understand that there should be some type of limitation. We need to make sure that we're communicating with each other, that we're bonding as, as a company. And, and that's important that we don't leave anyone out. And so, like you said, they say, hey, you know, we're, uh, we're going to do this as a group after dinner. I know it's your time, but hey, you know, let's just, just you know, enlighten me for a half an hour or something, whatever it is, you know, and and just try to really promote that, Hey, I know that's your room, and I know many of you want to go talk to your families, which is fine. But let's try to limit our time, and let's try to remain together as a crew. Yeah. You didn't, we really didn't get into this per se, but and it you meant you alluded to it a little bit. But is there still a stigma with mental health and in, in the modern fire service? I know there used to be, you know. And suck it up and and uh that that's pretty legacy that's pretty old right now but is there still is there still lingering 
where there are pockets of where you just still don't talk about it when when we know the science is like yeah yes you do talk about it yeah it's uh you know it's, it's a great question tom because uh as you know in the when we started it you just you just didn't talk i my my first four workshops ever were for the Philadelphia Fire Department. And I walked in that first class of about a hundred Philly firefighters and said, We'll be talking about PTSD and suicide prevention. I'd never seen so many people shift in the chair at once. It was like, hey man, that's uh, that's uncomfortable. We don't we don't want to talk about that. And, and we still see it today. There's there's no doubt about it. Has it improved? Absolutely. Absolutely has. Because we have so many of our brothers and sisters talking about their own issues, trying to promote education. Uh, we have so many organizations trying to create behavioral health programs, peer support teams. And that's it's absolutely incredible. But it, it is still out there. Even though a department might have a full behavioral health program, you're still going to have firefighters or EMS or dispatch that will not ask for help. They just don't want to, you know, be the weak link of the company. They don't want people to judge them. And, and I can tell you, my greatest um, point that I've learned here doing FBHA all these years, I've really learned not to judge people because mm -hmm. I've never walked in their shoes. When you hear the stories of our brothers and sisters, how how could I judge on um, the way they act or the way they they took their life because I didn't walk in their shoes. And, and I think that's, that's important. And uh, it's also important that we continue to have our brothers and sisters talk about issues to, and all, all sorts of types of issues, not just PTSD or addictions, because if I'm sitting in a workshop and I'm talking, I'm listening to some person, firefighter who's talking about their PTS. And I'm thinking, well, geez, that's not my issue. You know, my issue is I'm at the bar all the time and my, my spouse or partner wants to leave me. And, and so they might not have a connection as to saying, hey, I can stand up and say, I'm having issues. So they keep it within themselves. And, and you know, that's always been our culture, handle things on your own. And uh, there, there's, there's still pockets out there. There's no doubt about it. It's still ling it still lingers, right? It does absolutely. You know, it's well, it's been it's been our mantra here at FBHA. I don't want to change our culture. I love being a firefighter. I would do it ten out of ten times. What we want to do is we want to enhance it, and we enhance it through education. And mm. uh, that's that's the way I approach it. Enhancement through education. Right. What are uh, what are some of the best practices you're seeing out there? You know, there, there's some great ones out there besides peer support and, uh, and SISM teams. I think there's just a lot of, um, you start seeing a lot of yoga. You know, yoga in the, in the uh, fire departments. You're starting to see more and more different types of therapies that are open. Um, uh, you start seeing more EMDR therapy. You know, in, in 2010, when I started and I started looking at therapies, and especially in the fire service, there was an organization saying CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, is the only CBT or the only therapy for post-traumatic stress. You know, and it's like, wow, you know, that, that was the belief. And now there's just so many different types of therapies that are available from hypnosis to brain mapping, to brain performance, to EMDR, to CBT, to dogs, to horse therapy. And now I, I even see one now out there, There's it's called cow therapy, <laughs> you know? Oh, but you have to have, uh, we don't have that yet here in our, our department, <laughs> but you have to have these different resources available because one might not work for the for the next person. And so you have to have different types. There's a ketamine therapy, ketamine drops. Like I said, there's a, there's just, uh, there's stag, stagnant light uh, shots into the carotid artery to help block PTS triggers that affect. So like I said, if you truly as a department want to get involved in creating some type of behavioral health, 
know your resources, know what's in your community to provide for your people. So that one day when one, that one firefighter goes into the office and says, man, I'm really struggling with an issue, whatever it is, they're able to learn and to listen. They're able to refer to either a peer support or a chaplain, but also they're able to provide resources, proven resources for that member and their families. And that's key. Hmm. What else, what else do you want to share with the listeners, Jeff, that I may not have asked you that you think is of relevance, importance to well, any agency and, and any person that would be any agency that either is one dealing with suicide. So, so let's go there. Um, and I got actually a couple of questions. So let's go there. Let me, uh, an agency that's dealt with the suicide what are the things they can be doing for their for their people? Because that that is a it's it's it may not be a line of duty death, but it's a death nonetheless. And no, so, what, what what can they what can can they be doing? Uh, once again, Tom, it always depends upon the family. And if the family doesn't want anyone to announce it as a suicide, then you have to abide by that. But you know, the department members are going to know. Mm-hmm. It's just the, the nature of, of of our job. It's it's absolutely imperative that departments talk and communicate with their people. And and, and I alluded to it earlier when that chief called and said, "Jeff, I'm heading to this loss of my fire department member. What am I supposed to do?" And, and I told him, "Sir, speak from your heart." If, this, if you knew this person or this one hurts, let them know. This one absolutely hurts. Open up those lines of communication from the top. Uh, and, and at times that can be a problem because wherever I speak, we get great evaluations. But many say, I, I just wish our chief officers would attend. So what message does that send to the firefighters when they're there for you know, behavioral health or suicide prevention. What message does that send? And so you have to have buy-in from the top. And, and that's imperative. So departments that have had losses, they, the lines of communication, as well as build programs for families. Let families know. Uh, tonight here in our department, we are having a family night. We, ha- we hold a lot of family nights wherever we teach to let them know why we act the way that we do and how it affects you and your children at home. The, the communications is imperative. Having the resources is imperative. You know, peer support teams that can come in not just the day of or after, but can be there two, three, up to a week, two weeks afterwards, just checking in on their people. You know, it's it's very difficult uh, to lose a brother and sister. And, and it's so much more difficult when we don't know why. And I think that's what really uh, is difficult for families that I've known you know, do FBHAs because Tom, when, when you lose someone to a vehicle accident or a disease, tragic as that is, there's some understanding, but sure. for these families, they're, they're searching for answers that they'll never get here on earth. And so it becomes uh, uh, haunting for them. And unfortunately I, I've seen it. They look to blame someone so that that gives them some understanding well, my, my daughter-in-law had to do something that why my son killed himself. And and I'm not to judge. You know, I, I don't know the whole history of a family, but I think people find some type of answer if they feel like they blame someone. And you just don't know. I, I, I don't know. You know, like I said, I'm not an expert on this. I just, you know, I go from what I've learned and what I've seen. And uh, they're always, always going to search for an answer. And, it, and it's very difficult. So that's why we, we need to take care of the families. Include them still in Christmas parties or events. Because families have told us time and time again that it's like a double loss for them. Not only do they lo- lose their loved one, but then they lose those relationships mm-hmm. from the fire department. And that's, and that's very difficult for them. So I would tell departments to you know 
have your officers learn how to listen, have your peer support teams, your chaplains always ready, educate, talk, open up your hearts, and then please always remember the families. You know, even on the anniversary of a death, if you stop over with a card or a dinner, you know, and say, hey, we're, we're always thinking of, you know, firefighter or whoever it was, you know, your, your loved one. Uh, yeah, and you see it a lot of times. Um, and there was, and it's, it wasn't a suicide, but there was a, a firefighter who uh, line of duty death and um, the crew, the company on the day of the, this firefighter's daughter graduation, uh, they were there, uh, you know, to help, you know, walk her into the procession and things. And, you know, so, so you see that mm -hmm. and they, they probably can't even imagine what that means to that, that family to, to be there for them. And, and, and that's absolutely important. Retirees, Jeff. Talk, talk to me about retirees, because there's a loss of identity when you retire, I think, for, for many of us. Uh, absolutely. Uh, when I started looking at the data and started noticing, right now we're at about 308. As difficult as it is to get active, uh, we have about 308 retirees that I have validated. 37 of them took their lives within the first week of retirement. Good Lord. And so I went out and spoke to 127 recently retirees, both fire and EMS, and found out really quickly, like you said, top three were loss of identity, loss of belonging, and lack of purpose. These are real issues that we face in the fire service. And it's part of what we feel is you, every department needs a retirement program. A year, year and a half out, how are we going to help them transition to that retirement? And we're, I still haven't developed that program yet. But there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, we, we can talk and we can offer uh, that aspect, you know, instead of just giving them a party with an ax on the board, say, hey, thanks. You know, can we extend uh, counseling benefits? Can we extend peer support and chaplain visits to them and their family? Can, one of the things I like is that can we include them as a mentorship program for the academies? You know, maybe there's some fire ca cadet that just can't do ropes. Well, maybe you got a retiree that can come in and, and help with cadets in, in that aspect as well. You know, there's just, let's use their talents. I'm a firm believer as a fire and EMS, we are a plethora of information, experience, and talent. Let's use them. Let's bring them in one night to talk to our companies about what retirement looks like, what to expect. Let's not just let them sail off into the sunset and forget all about them. Let's use their talents that that uh, they've experienced and now what they recommend. It, and we do such a great job in the fire service. Through the academy, we, we teach them about their benefits and their 401s and their pensions. Well, now we have to start talking about retirement or on-duty injury. What happens if you're, like I said, we're all one slip off a ladder changing careers. What are you preparing yourself for? And that goes back to that whole premise about education. Continue to go to school, trade school, business school, whatever it is. If you have a hobby, go to school to learn how to, do I want to make it an LLC, a not-for-profit? How do I market it? How do I understand employee benefits? All these things continue to learn because you know as well as I do, 26 years goes by in a heartbeat yeah it flies and we need to prepare for that day good advice good advice jeff um i i always say that we need to prepare for our future yesterday that's that's my saying need to prepare for our future yesterday so yeah sounds like the you're doing the lord's work with the fbha well like I said, I, I've been blessed. It, it is difficult work. It took me a while to finally acknowledge and, and say that, that this is difficult work to hear and, and validate the methods that our brothers and sisters take their lives and the stories, the families that, you know, watching their pain and struggle, the, the thousands that have called us over the years, you know, searching for counselors. But it, it's also been a blessing. It, it truly is. And uh, as you know, 
There's no better feeling in this world than helping out someone else. And, and that's why we're in this job. Well, it's been a blessing to have you on the podcast today. Tom, I absolutely appreciate it. Uh, keep up your great work. We we all work together, right? That's why we called it. 100%. Another- I, I look forward to our public Oh, I'm sorry. Say that again. I'm interrupting you. I'm I said that's why we, we called it Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance, because we're all in this together. Not one person, one organization can do all these things. We all work together, sir. And, and your part is just as important as anyone else's. Well, we're doing the best we can. And uh, this has been a particularly good podcast. I'm really uh, grateful to you, Jeff, for what you, your wife, um, and the mission of FHBA is is doing out there i learned a lot today actually uh, i was taking even some notes as you were as you were talking but this will be this will be worth uh, worth watching again so um thank you so very much and um, i look forward to our paths crossing again real soon i appreciate it it's been an honor to be on this podcast sir so stay right. safe the honor is ours jeff the honor is ours all right take care